Hi, everyone. Happy Saturday. So before we start today's segment, and I am really, really, really excited about today's segment. So what I'm going to say to you is get a piece of paper and a pencil or pen because you're going to want to take notes. I promise you, you're going to want to take notes on this segment today. Okay. So before we start, of course, I know this has been another very difficult week for all of us. Um, I do feel in my heart that we're starting to see light at the end of the tunnel. And we're seeing that things are starting to move. And, and um, it really feels like there's hope that there is definitely going to be change. Um, and there's going to be justice. And we're going to have a new way to be able to connect and um, to just be able to coexist all together. And for that, I'm starting to feel, like I said, very hopeful and full, full of possibility. Okay, so before we start and we introduce our amazing guest today, let's just take a couple of big, deep healing breaths. So today, let's just inhale love. Okay, for five counts, we're going to hold our breath. I know you guys know this by now. Hold our breath and then exhale pleasure. Yes. It's okay to have some pleasure for sure. Okay, so let's go. Big, deep breaths, healing breaths. Inhale. Hold your breath and smile. Exhale, ha, pleasure. Ha. Inhale, love. Hold your breath and smile. Exhale, pleasure. One more deep healing. Fill those lungs up, okay? Hold your breath. Exhale, ha, pleasure. I want you to know I do that exercise to also show you because trust me, I do these three breaths probably 10 times through the course of my day. As soon as I hear something that maybe is could like make me a little anxious or as soon as I'm confronted with something and I need to take a moment to anchor myself before I I respond because I'm always wanting to respond and not react. So that's why I love to do it with all of you. So you get a feel for it. You get an energy for it because it's a tool. Breath work like this is clearly a tool. Okay. So now we're going to start. So first thing I want you to understand is that the last, maybe the last 10 sessions that we've done, conversations that we've had, they've all been about the pivot and how we're reinventing ourselves and how we're pivoting in this time where, you know, 42 million people have lost their jobs and many of these jobs will not be coming back. So we've been really talking and trying to really give you some good solid skills so that when you finish these conversations, you can actually start putting some form to what we're talking about. And that's why I love this talk we're gonna to have today because there's all times in life when you have to pivot and reinvent yourself because of the market. I mean, think about it. If you were selling fax machines, boom, one day you're selling fax machines, the next day there's really no more fax machines. Or think about Blockbuster. I remember when Blockbuster was on every single corner in New York City. And that was like one of the most fun things you do was to go and get your, your video and go home and watch your video. And boom, one day it's like no more Blockbuster and it's all about Netflix. Okay. Even books. Like I remember when I moved to California, my, one of my favorite things to do was to hang out at Barnes and Noble. I just loved hanging out in Barnes and Noble. Barnes and Noble, gone. Well, that's what today's talk about is, is that 
this very impressive woman created something very, very powerful, very trailblazing in the fitness community. And that was ECA, East Coast Alliance, which was one of, which was the first, I would say, convention for the fitness, for the group fitness instructor that was really like cool and present and had an energy and a vibe and a vitality and it was colorful and it had texture and it was something that when she offered it, trust me, people came from the tri-state area and even really further up, they would come from Florida, wherever it got to be so popular that she actually opened one on the West Coast. So it was something that everyone, it was, like I said, it was innovation. And she did this for like 25 years. And at one point, she's at the apex, the top, boom, and the industry starts changing and bang, it's over. And that's kind of like what we're in right now. One minute you're working, you're working, the next minute it's over. And that's exactly what happened. So I'm gonna introduce you to Carol Scott, who, like I said, she's the founder and CEO of East Coast Alliance, which I believe, like I said, was about 25 years. She was also the National Aerobic Director for Equinox, and she currently has her own consulting company. So Carol, welcome to Conversations with my people. Hi, I'm so happy and honored to be here, especially Lavinia, you were the one that hired me for Equinox. So <laughs> yeah. we go back a long way. We'll go back a long way. So, you know, Carol, usually I start this by saying to the uh, entrepreneur, okay, take us to your origin story. But I don't want to do that because I think that your story to start with, you had ECA, like I said, you were on the top, you were moving and shaking, you were grooving, you were bringing in instructors from all over the world. You were literally filling up New York City hotels with this huge convention. Um, you launched a lot of people, you launched a lot of programs. I mean, you really did something. So, I mean, like I literally am getting goosebumps because you did something really, really, really special for this industry. I mean, you were part of making it so legit, like a really professional, professional um, a career. Prior to that, it wasn't really that like, so people weren't like, oh, I want to be that. It was like sort of something they did in transition to. Yes. But it was like, oh, until I get my break I'm on Broadway or until I get my break on this, until I, whatever. But I really feel actually it was the collaboration between Equinox and ECA that really sort of legitimized it. We, you know, I know you worked hard on making sure that they, that the group fitness people could get insurance. I mean, there were so many things that weren't sexy and weren't like fun, but they were things that were necessary, like a real foundation. I mean, what you did really, like I said, I get goosebumps because it was so special for our industry and it really made um, such a profound difference on our industry. And that's why I love this story because one day, just take us, one day you're on the top of your gang, you're moving and shaking and doing and grooving and, and organizing all this. And the next day, the industry makes a shift like this, bam, bang, it's it's over. Whew. How do you go from this to this? Like, tell us that journey. Sure. Well, it wasn't like overnight, but it felt like overnight. It happened over a, a very short time, though. I would say a few years where it was once very generalized and it became very specific. All the fitness boutiques started to open up and they had their proprietary programming and their proprietary instructors and people didn't share as much information and then certain information wasn't relevant to their business um, so it became very segmented and my convention brought everybody in but they needed to learn what they needed to learn in their own little spaces so I watched like my my uh, expenses went like this but my attendance was going like that so you know the handwriting's on the wall so what do you do and it had been 25 years of going at it so I really felt like, you know, well, what's, what's left? You know, what haven't I done within this space that I need to do? And when I took a really long introspective look, I was like, you know what? I, 
kind of did everything I want to do. You know, my whole purpose was really, I, I'll put it under like a really broad umbrella is helping others. You know, how can I help? So I felt like, all right, look what I did. I birthed, I birthed an industry and now it's going off. You know, it's like raising children and now your children take over and, and they do their thing and you, you kind of have to let them. So it was, um, it was a lot of reality checks. Like, okay, you know, they don't need me anymore. They're on their own. Look at them. Look how big they, they are. You know, they don't, they can walk all by themselves and they could start everything new. And then, you know, you go through a lot of, um, a little bit of self-doubt there because, all right, I'm not relevant anymore. What's my place? Where am I going to go? How am I going to fit in? Because it is different and you do have to let the next generation take over. Um, it's almost like sports. You wouldn't expect, uh, you know, Michael Jordan to come on and go, all right, I'm going to compete against LeBron James at this point. Um, so you can't do that. So what do you do? Can you go into coaching? Can you go into you know, management. So I looked at that and I said, you know what, I've been consulting people all along on the side, which again, I highly recommend always have a side gig. Uh, so I just stepped into that because that I think is a really important lesson. And if you're writing things down, don't put all, you know, it's an old saying, don't put all your eggs in one basket because that basket might break one day and you need to have diversions and different places, sometimes out of your industry, where you can put away some nest eggs so that if you have a giant pivot like this, you're not at the mercy of finance. Right, that's so true, so true. You know, it's interesting because I remember around that time when I was actually doing a little bit consulting and I remember having lunch and I'm sitting on 19th Street having lunch and uh, you know, with this gentleman and and I would share with him some of the stuff that, you know, the where I thought, you know, there was some energy where there wasn't. And by the end of the conversation, I said to him, by the way, and this was just like an afterthought. And I said, by the way, you're going to have to watch out for studios. And he looked at me and he's like, what do you mean? And I'm like, studios, they're on there. They're, they're coming back. And he looked at me and he said, oh, Lavinia, like as if I had three eyes, oh, Lavinia. He said, no. He said, that day is over. He said, people have gotten used to the one-stop shopping. Like, it, like we're Barneys. So why would they want to go back to that? Like they have everything. And I just remember walking out of there with this just feeling, because I don't know, like I always say in the fitness or wellness world, things got downloaded for me. I, I don't, I don't, sometimes when I would wake up with this idea, I would even be like, how did I get this idea? But I just remember knowing, like when I walked out of that sushi restaurant, I don't know how I knew, but I just knew that that was going to be a shift, that that was going to happen. Like it was just this feeling of, because also things ebb and flow and they change, you know, people also, they get bored. Yes. Like one of the things, and we get bored. Like, that's another thing. Like, like, I love when you said, I mean, not that I, I don't always believe in having a side gig. Cause I think sometimes like plan B could sort of keep you out of really coming into fruition with plan A. But, but I do believe that you have to keep trying new things. Like it's our, for you to keep growing and sprouting and being that person, like that just, knows things and popping like popcorn like you have to be out there you got to be trying new things you have to um yeah you have to be open to having those level of experiences because at times when you have to make a pivot you kind of know what's percolating already around you what like what seeds have been planted what is starting to get a little fertile but if you're like this the whole time then you don't see where there's fertile soil all around you so, I see that a lot. I see that a lot where people are very myopic and they look and they're just channeled into their business. And you really do have to keep moving. You know, the whole expression, you can't see the forest from the trees. And not only within your industry, but the world, you know, in its, in a, in its wholeness. What's going on politically, government, what's going on culturally, what's popping, you know, domestically, internationally, what magazines, you know, read and, and make yourself open for everything. Because you know, you've always been, I think, the best at deciphering the next trends and seeing what's the future and opening up to that. And that's 
it, that's very, very important. And staying relevant is also looking ahead. Right. Okay. So I want to ask you this question. You had this big aha moment. You had all this, and then you had a failure. Yeah. And we all have failures. Trust me. We all have those failures. So now you have this huge failure. And now it's like, you got to get back on the horse. So take us through. And you know, what I love about you is that, first of all, you got grit and you have courage and you're fearless. And those are the things like, to me, teaching people about grit, fearlessness and courage is even more important than all the things they learn at like business school. Because I've, I mentor a lot of women, especially that come out of the business school. And when I start giving them some of the things that, that they need to do to start being successful, they look at me sometimes like, hmm. like this feeling of like, oh, Lavinia, I went to business school, so I didn't have to do that stuff. And I'm thinking like, you got to be kidding, girl. Like, do you want to have a successful business or not? Like, it does not work that way. Like, that's great. That gave you knowledge. But you still have to get your little hands dirty. You still have to be able to, to build that. You got to get gritty. You got to have courage. You have to put that ego aside. So let's talk about it because I can imagine 25 years, very successful, being the it girl, the it person. And then all of a sudden this, like I even think of that and I'm like, like that, had to be, that, yeah, that had to be heavy and that had to be hard and that had to be, so take us how you like got back out there. Like, what did you do? How did you? Well, I didn't, I never looked at ECA's end as a failure. I looked at it like I had birthed a nation and now, okay, that was a step. Now what? And I did have like, I was tied up, but I was very, I always looked at ECA like, let me not get too tied up in my identity with this company. Yes, I am the founder, I'm the CEO, uh, the buck stops here, I'm in charge. But if I let myself identify my self-worth with my company and something happens to my company, where's my self-worth gonna be? So I always took steps during um, to, to distance myself somewhat in terms of my self-worth. So, okay, I have this failure. I'm not a youngster anymore. That was 25 years of business, meaning I'm a certain age now and I'm looking. So of course, the first things that hit me is, do I have any relevance? Am I gonna be able to offer anything to someone? And then, okay, now that I did this thing, what's next? Like, where do I go? What do I do? So I kind of did what I always do. I look at, okay, you know, while I'm thinking about what I'm going to do, what do I like? What do I enjoy? When I first graduated from college, I realized I didn't want to be a phys ed teacher. So I went into travel because I figured, let me go see the world while I'm figuring it out. So I said to myself, what, what do I love? What am I passionate about right now? And I knew it would take me some time to sort of reinvent myself to go back into the fitness industry, which is really my, my first love. But I knew, well, it was a little different than what it was. So I'm going to have to do a little homework and I'm going to have to humble myself and I'm going to have to check my ego and go back and start down again. Nobody really, you know, you go, well, I'm Carol Scott of ECA and you meet people and they're like, well, who, well who's ECA? You know, what's ECA? Because when they're done that, it had gone. So I wasn't Carol Scott of ECA. I was just Carol Scott. So that's an awakening. Um, I have to like, okay, prove myself all over again. And then what do I want to do while I'm doing that? So I took time out. I pulled myself back and I looked at, you know, where is the industry headed? And I attended everyone else's stuff, what they were doing at the time. But, you know, I didn't really want to just sit back and do that because I really wasn't sure, like maybe I had done enough in the fitness industry. Maybe it was time to move to another industry. And I had always, I had a saying, fitness is my business, but fashion is my passion. So I really loved fashion. So I said, well, you know, Mark Jacobs is not going to hire me to be his next dressmaker. So where do I go in fashion to see what that world is like? And I'm very good at sales. I had a lot of experience in sales. So I take a step back and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to get a job as a retail sales associate in a, fit, in, a, uh, in a fashion boutique. And that's what I did. I went to East Hampton. I got a job at Tenant, which I love. And I started working two, two, three days a week. 
just to kind of immerse myself in the industry, see what goes on, watch what people buy. And I had a ball. I was dressing people. I was playing dress up with live people. They were coming in for events. I got to dress them up for like a wedding or a bridesmaid or they're going on vacation or they have some special dinner party that night. I met tons of interesting people. I learned so much from that job that, that you know, my knowledge went from here to here. And, and, a, and an awakening point was really funny one time when Harvey, I mean, we both know him, Harvey Spivak, the CEO, the head of Equinox and, you know, um, SoulCycle and Rumble and Pure, he walks in and here's my former boss. I was the director and I'm going to sell him a pair of pants now. So, you know, that was a humbling experience, but I could I, you know, I'm like, look, I'm all that. I'm not identified by just my job. Yes. And I'm going to sell that best pair of pants I can to Harvey. And I'm going to stand up there and be proud and do my thing. So sometimes, you know, you, you shouldn't worry, like, I'll clean floors. You know, I have my own dignity. I have my own level of who I think I am. So a job can't take me down from my self-worth. I am who I am. So I can do anything. And I strongly suggest if you are entering an industry or are curious about one, you do exactly what you said. Don't wait until the big job comes along. Um, go in small because that happened to me too. I went and I said, okay, I'm going to go work for somebody else. I'm going to go be a uh, director of professional development, or I'm going to be a COO, or I'm going, I'm going to take some kind of job in, in corporate fitness. And wow, I got, slapped around because nobody hired me <laughs> nobody wanted me and at first it was like uh, a little you know i'm rejected oh my god rejection very hard to handle but then i said you know what this is all happening for a reason they don't want me but maybe i don't want them either because i strongly believe that when you find your passion and you find your lane the universe just comes in and helps it all come together. And sometimes you don't have to overthink it. It'll just organically happen. And it wasn't. I was like butting up, butting up. So I was like, okay, let me take another step back and say, this isn't working. You know, I'm not, I'm not making inroads. And I don't look at failure as like, oh, failure. I look at failure as like, okay, a learning experience. Why isn't this working? You know, I'm all that. Why isn't it working? So okay, let me look at why. And I realized, you know, this was not my lane. This is not what I have to do. And the industry is not where it was when, when I was the big delegator of where it should be. So I took a step back. I started going to other things, looking and seeing. And that's really when I got the perspective of where the new fitness industry was while still enjoying my little job and tenant, you know, hustling and busting the clothes. So that's, that's kind of my transition thing. I love that. And I, I really believe that you're right on point doing the things that you're doing, because first of all, I always say your lane finds you. You don't find your lane. Now, that doesn't mean it comes and gets you out of bed. Your lane doesn't come and wake you up out of bed and say, come on, I'm going to take you. You've got to be in it. So the fact is that you're in it. You're in it. You're. I mean, and I think fashion is perfect because so many things follow fashion. Yes. Like people don't realize that fashion sets the tone for so much. I mean, there's just there's so much connection between so many things and fashion. So to be in there and then again, to be humbling. I mean, what I love is, and this is for people out there, guys, you're going to have to show up the best version of yourself, regardless of what you're doing. That, and you never know who you're going to meet. You never know what that, that next person, the customer, you know, maybe one of the buyers, you just never know, uh, you know, a customer has a, a friend. Oh my God, I love you. I love what you're doing. I love you. Because what they connect to is your energy. Yes. It's like there's an energy about people that have, have wisdom, that have experience, that literally have climbed their way up a mountain. Because I always say like, if I lost everything tomorrow and I, I'm still Lavinia, I'm the one that climbed that friggin' mountain. You can't take that away from me. I'm no, still that person. Will enable you to do whatever you're going to pivot into. Always do everything with, with a level of excellence and yeah. confidence. 
You know, I read something. I actually took a note this morning when I was reading this because I loved it. It says discipline is the strongest form of self-love. It's like saying, I don't need this instant pleasure because I'm worth having my big dream. And, you know, I always have talked about discipline because it takes discipline. It takes discipline. It takes courage. It takes grit. It takes fearlessness to literally go out there and reinvent yourself. And like so much courage, you know, like, it really does. I mean, I remember years ago, and, and, I, and I use it, I still use it on a lot of the young people that I mentor. And it was funny because I had this one girl that I've worked with a little bit. She had just gotten um, a fellowship at UCLA for plastic surgery. And she was very shy, very, very, very shy. And, I've, and the doctor who is the plastic surgeon there at UCLA has sent me clients to some of my workshops to just help them in different areas of their life. So he's a big fan of what I do in my work. And then he said to me, Lavinia, I'd love for you to work with her because this girl is so talented. She's amazing at what she does, but her shyness because of her culture has, it's gonna, it's gonna hinder her, it's gonna hurt her. So I went back to something that I, I learned because I did the entire curriculum at, at um, Landmark you know, 30 years ago. And one, of, and one of the uh, exercises that they gave us was to go in and out of the elevator and introduce yourself to people. And I remember the first time I did that, I was standing, we were in the World Trade Center and I was, I, I had to, I went down to a floor and then you had to wait and then you had to wait for the elevator. And when the elevator opened and I just remember before the elevator was coming, I was shaking. I mean, I'm in the middle of New York City. Like this isn't exactly the friendliest place where you're gonna like start busting this move. But it was like, I had no choice. This is where I live. This is where I did the course. And I, you know, again, the World Trade Center and it's, and they, I walk in and I start introducing myself and my hands were shaking. I mean, literally shaking. And I got some interesting responses, but you know what? We were to do that for a half hour. Within 10 minutes, I was, my, the fear was gone. It was just that initial thing to do that. And you know, I gave that exercise to this young woman. I said, I just want you to go up and introduce yourself to people for 30 days. Of course, there were no elevators over where she was, but, and you know what? Those little steps of doing something different, experiencing something different, it makes a profound because you get to see, oh, that was silly. I didn't have to be so afraid to do that. And that's how it is in all of these things. Like it's those little steps that make you move in the right direction in the right direction, in the right direction. That, you know, because people are uncomfortable with change. I actually embrace change. I love change. I'm the type of person that gets bored easily. So I don't mind change, but I know a lot of people, are, they're very nervous about change and they, they like being having a set pattern. But if you can kind of teach yourself to do little things, these are little skills that come in handy when the big skills are needed and it's practice. Right. You take little baby steps and then you integrate them into your life and then, then they're not scary anymore. Right. So I know that you um, talk a lot about helping people on their journey and talk about your authentic self, connecting to your authentic self. And, you know, I always love that the authentic self. I, I want you to take a second to explain what that is and just take people through because I do think that there, we're in a time when people have to get like down and dirty to the truth of who they really are. Like, who am I really? Like, am I really showing up in, in the best version of myself? Am I really doing the amount of work? Like, you know, there's difference between like having a desire and having a burning desire. I always say like, to be an entrepreneur, you kind of have to have an burning desire. Like, it's almost like I can't sleep because I have to do this. Like I could see it. I can see it all working. I could see people coming. I, I can feel it. I can taste it. Everything about it. It's that burning. And you just work and work and work and work and work. Then there's a lot of people that have a desire. I have a desire to do that. Well, uh, having just that energy of, of a desire, but you're not working 24 seven. 
I would almost say like that you, you may want to rethink that or just figure out how you can collaborate with somebody else that has that burning desire. Because at this time of pivoting, not everybody is going to be able to pivot and be an entrepreneur. Absolutely not. I mean, I don't want people to even think out there that I believe that everybody has that capability. We don't. The same way everybody does not have the capability to be a prima ballerina. I don't care how much practice you do. I don't care how much rehearsal. I don't care. You will never be a prima ballerina. There is like that five foot eight, you know, boy that wants to go to the NBA. Dang, he's not going to the NBA. I don't care if he throws 10,000 balls into that. He's not going to the NBA. Like yes. we have to get real. We got to be able to have courage to, to look at who we really are, look at our skill set, look at our energy, look at also like our constitution. Not everybody has the constitution to work like that. You know, I see that there are some people that need to just kind of work the eight hours a day. Yeah. You know, more than that, they get sick, they get tired. Like you got it. Like now's the time to like right get direction. real. People like a layout and a, and a definite, they show up nine o'clock, they're done at five, put everything right. away. That's not going to cut it for an entrepreneur. Right. And that's okay because every entrepreneur needs a team. That's great. That's, we exactly. all need our team. So it's like, and, and that's another talk that I think we'll eventually do is the talk of like how to align yourself with entrepreneurs and be part of their team. Because like, it, that's what it is. It's all a team, Right. But take us through like how you connected with your authentic self, some of the things that you did, the work that maybe you did to be able to connect that to get where you are today, you're launching, you know, you saw some things happening during the pandemic and you're like, okay, I'm ready to, to um, shift into that. Yes. Um, well, I, I have an entrepreneurial spirit because I am um, more or less fearless and relentless and a risk taker. And I think those are the three characteristics, part of the three characteristics that you need to be an entrepreneur. You need to be a little bit of a risk taker, um, you know, willing to fail and relentless. So I already had that. So, okay, that's, that's well and good. And now how are you going to channel it? Um, like you said, if you, if you don't feel like you can put in, you work 24 seven, then you might want to work for an entrepreneur that might be your lane. But if you're looking to be an entrepreneur, then you really should follow. You have to be passionate about what you're doing. And that's when I noticed why I wasn't getting those jobs and why I was getting turned down. When I pulled back and I looked at it, I was like, you know what? My desire is not really there. My, my passion that is like, I don't, oh, it's three in the morning. Oh my God, I'm still working. Wasn't going to be there for them. I didn't feel it for them. So I pulled back and went, you know what? I'm going to defeat, I'm going to lose here because this isn't going to work. I'm not passionate enough about that project or that company to see it and give them my all. You have to really, like, like you said, a, a writer needs to write, a painter needs to paint, a musician needs to play music, a dancer needs to dance. You have to feel like that to then launch into your entrepreneurship. So I floated a bit because I couldn't find that desire. So I thought, oh, maybe, you know, it's gone and that's it. And I gave it all and that was 25 years. And now, all right, I got to find something that I'm just le less passionate about and be a worker and not an entrepreneur. But then the pandemic hit and I think I kind of got slapped in the face with seeing, I was doing my little due diligence, going around to the different clubs and the events and everything, but I had to do that on foot. So I was going, going, and there's only a certain amount of ground you can cover. But once we were all locked in and I had all this time to myself, I went online. So maybe I saw 10, 20 things when I was on foot, but I started to see a hundred things when I was online. And when you start to see that many things, you start to see trends. You start to see the same thing happening over and over and over again. And I just noticed, and I, and I have always seen this because like you, you, you were always able with Equinox, you saw those amazing people. You saw that talent, grabbed them for, the, for Equinox. I did the same thing at ECA. Who, who are those talented people or those diamonds in the rough that are going to become talent? Um, like, like Sean Thompson, you know, Sean T. 
he was an instructor in New Jersey. He was taking someone else's class. I noticed him. I said, whoa, you know, he's got it. He's got something. So I started to do that online and I saw a lot of people diving into the digital platform and really falling flat. And they might have been huge stars in their room, you know, because it's a little different when you're in a group X room, you have the other people's energy to feed off of and you can make eye contact and you have the music blasting and it's different. But in this space, it's quiet. It's just you and the camera. And that is, a, a different navigation. And I saw a lot of fitness instructors struggling with that. Mm -hmm. And I saw other people thriving with that. Like um, Isaac Calpedo, Calpedo, Isaac Boots, phew, took off, right? Why? Super enthusiastic, has that amazing personality, you know, has all that old school charm because he's a dancer and boom, he took off. And then I would see someone who, great exercise selection, progression, all the right things systematically and format like, but lacked the charisma or lacked what he needed to pull off the space that's in the digital space to create a beautiful and workable program. So a light bulb went off, which tends to happen with entrepreneurs. And I said, you know what? This is where I need to be. I need, my big vision is always helping people. How am I gonna help people? I can help people launch digitally and I could then now I can go back into mentoring and coaching people how to be that authentic real self and when you talk about uh, let's let's define authenticity it's being you you know um that old saying you know be yourself everyone else is taken it is true if you see something and then you just mimic it to be well that's successful so I'll go in that lane I'll be that because that's successful you're just a replica. You're a copy of the original. So you can never be as good. You're, you'll never shine as bright because it's really not you. But if you go with, this is me, this is my definition of, of who I am, of what I want. And that takes some introspection. What are your you know, code of ethics? What are your beliefs? What's your vision, your mission? How, what's your bottom line, your elevator pitch? Can you condense all you are in a sentence? Um, which I think is really an important homework assignment to do. And then boil that down and then take a look at it and go, oh, all right, this is who I am. This is where I can help. And then go into that direction. And that was my aha moment because I just was bombarded with seeing the same things over and over. And I was like, oh, this is, these people all need help. They all need my help. I know how to correct that. I know what to do. I know what to see and say and help them. And that's uh, where I am right now. And you know, it's, it's interesting because <clears throat> This morning in my meditation, I was thinking about you. Like I, you know, just kind of tune in and I think about it. And then I have to always think about a story that like that I had a personal story. And the story that came into me this, this morning was when I really thought about like what I see your gift, like your gift, like at, at this stage in life and where you are right now, like I see your gift. And it's funny because we haven't really had that conversation before today about that exactly. And I saw, it brought me back to when I was 12 years old and I was at dancing school. Everybody in this community knows that I dance and it was always my passion. And I, at, my, at our recital, the June before, I got to see this other ballet teacher dance. And I was mesmerized by what an amazing performer she was. And I went to my mom and I said, I want her next year. And my mom said, why? I said, mom, did you see her dance? Like, she is, she's the most beautiful dancer. Like there isn't one teacher at this school that dances the way she does. And my mom said, but that doesn't mean she's a great teacher. But my little 12 year old person could not understand that. No, if she could dance like that, then she could teach me to perform like that as well. And I went to the head of the school and I requested to be in that woman's class. And she even said to me, I think you're better in the class you're in the video. And I was like, I was persistent and I went and I really, really fought for that. And after about three months in the class, I realized this teacher was all wrong for me <laughs> because she didn't actually focus on us. While we were doing all of our footwork, she was like doing her own footwork and looking at her own footwork in the, she wasn't focusing on us. And what I really got out of that when I thought about that is that's who you are. Like you 
are a great teacher. Like I just feel that in my soul. Like I feel that at this stage, you're really the person that can really help put form and put frame because everybody needs form and frame when they're going and everybody needs help. Like it's so important. Like there's very few things that we can do alone. Like I, my whole life is one big collaboration. Yeah, you know, so it really does. So that's what I really got. And then when you just said that, I was like, yes, like I love, I love when my, the vision that comes in is like, and then somebody says something and you're like, oh my God, like that's it. And I really think that what you just talked about, like I get chills, like that feels like so aligned because you know, it's your experience, it's your wisdom, it's your life. It's like, it's what you've done, the fact that you've done that. I really believe that you can really help this next phase of bringing people into um, being able to be relevant, to have a really good platform to be able to bring to the world. Because there's also, there's, it, it's for everyone. Yeah. You know, it's like when Equinox started, it wasn't always easy because there were only 15% of the demographic that worked out. Right. Today, it's like 85%. Yeah, everybody so, exercises now. Everybody exercises. It's part of, it's part of lifestyle, you know, even if it's just out there walking or whatever. So there's so much that people need. And it isn't just, you know, high impact aerobics and it isn't just hit and it isn't just Pilates and it isn't just yoga. Like it's all of it. And the truth of it is, is really where real wellness lives because I know that's something that you talk about is like real wellness is in when you're working out that you're connected, that you're conscious and that you're actually doing something good for your body. Not, you know, very often, I look at fitness and I kind of cringe because I'm like, oh, this is about vanity. This isn't about health. You know, so often people are working out for vanity. They're working out for the high tush. They're working out for the biceps, but they're actually injuring themselves. They're creating too much inflammation. They're creating too much joint issues. Like, you know, I always say you're only as strong as your weakest ligament, tendon, or joint. And like somebody like you really knows that, like you could help these people really create smart programs, but yet do have the fat, the fun factor. And I do think that that is necessary to come back because I do want to say that I feel like our industry lost that a little bit, you know, for years when Equinox started and when you were there, those classes were all about, it was always, you walked in there and it was a party. It was showtime. And that's what we would say, showtime. And those are the people that we hired. And we put those people in that knew how to elevate and take it between the music and the lights and their sweat and the way they could kick their leg up or the way that just the way they could connect. And then all of a sudden it was like, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, CrossFit came in and CrossFit came into the market. And then everybody had to create classes like CrossFit, CrossFit, CrossFit. And then it was like, out went the group fitness people and in went like personal trainers. And it got boring because personal trainer is a great skill set, but doesn't mean that it's necessarily to be in that room. You've got to cultivate something else. And so when I see somebody like Isaac Boots really nailing it, I'm so happy because that is really what it used to be. It used to be yeah. that fun and you couldn't wait to get in that class and laugh and have fun and burn your little body and sweat. And yet it was all in the context of fun, you know? Yeah. We have to come back to the whole picture. Just like you said, it's a holistic approach to wellness, not just fitness. You're not in there just to blow up your bicep, but you're there to de-stress. You're there to blow off steam. You're there to to you know restore and you're there for joy and the emotional component of it and if you can put all of that together then you have a superior and winning combination and now even more than ever i mean you know being quarantined and being you know in the home and all of that depression sets in and sleeplessness and all these other factors that you know we really need that now we need our fitness professionals to take a broader approach to their craft and to really, you know, bring it. Right, I love that. All right, so 
we're going to be closing soon, but if you had to give some or these young entrepreneurs or people out there that are thinking about a pivot, just three tips, three tips on the, the three things that they would need to focus on. What would those three things, like, what would you say? These are the things I just. Believe. I think, I think that irregardless of fitness, fashion, whatever industry you're looking at, I think these are the three things that you need. One, you need to really identify and follow your passion. Two, I think you need a support system and you need to look for the people that are going to raise you up. Nobody can do this alone. And then third, the last one is find a mentor or someone that has been there or has some experience that can help you along that you can turn to for questions and answers. And I think those three are probably the most important things that will help you propel yourself if, if that's your dream. I love that. And I think you're right on with that because it does take, you have to be able to ask for help. You have yeah. to be able to ask for guidance. Um, and, and I know you're, um, you've are you offered something great for all of our watchers. They can yes. go on to LaviniaErico.com and sign up for a, a, a free consultation with you. Yes, I'll give you 30 minutes. Ask me whatever you want. We can delve into whatever you think you need assistance with, or you can come with a clean slate and we can, I'll help you map out, you know, a direction or find a passion or answer any questions you have on, you know, monetizing through emotional support. I love that. Oh my God, Carol, thank you so, so, so much. much fun. <laughs> yeah, it really feels good. It feels like I, I love talking to you. I could keep I love going. You anyway, I, I could love this here for hours. We're both so power. We're both so passionate about it, and you know, nothing makes me happier when I watch people who really never liked working out. To them, working out was like you know, I have to f and work out, you know. And then all of a sudden, you help them, you guide them to find something that actually they enjoy because you're able to connect to them and realize how they like to move, what kind of, and then when you, when they find the right thing, it's like all of a sudden when they call you and they're like, oh my God, I just finished 30 sessions of this and look at my body. Look how good I'm sleeping better. My, I'm not as ag agitated. I'm not as frustrated. I feel so great. Like when you do that, it's like, I mean, that just makes you feel so good. That's worth everything. You know, it's yeah. just worth everything. I think in general in life, when you find things that are effortless versus when you're beating your head against the wall, those are directions to tell you, okay, I got to move away from beating my head against the wall. And I have to go towards the things that seem effortless. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. We'll see you Wednesday. I have a really, really, really great guest on, um, David Harris. He's been with me. Yep. Yeah, um, from the Definitely beginning. Here. I actually hired him as my trainer. Um, and he went on to really run the entire fitness department at Brilliant person. Uh, he's Love brilliant David. and smart. He's he's just so on point. And he completed about uh, a year ago. And now he's on to another amazing, amazing pivot. And I think his story is also um, really, really impressive. Yes. All right, everybody. Thank you. See you next week. Be safe.